Bless the God of our salvation. Jesus said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Using the form in your order of service, let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the collect of the day found in your worship bulletin. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Jeremiah, Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who made a way in the sea, a path of the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals, the ostriches. 
For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsively by verse portions of Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then we were like those who dream. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I grew up surrounded by the things of God. I went to church regularly where my grandfather was the pastor. I went to Christian school through eighth grade. I grew up hearing testimonies to miraculous healings and the never-ending love of Jesus. As far back as I can remember, I was, in theory, a lover and follower of Christ. But I was also a lover of a lot of other things. I loved novels, and the way an afternoon spent with one could transport me to places I could never have dreamed of. I loved the way I could get lost in the emotion of music and understand my own emotions as I watched them played out by a character on TV or film. I loved how I could gain empathy for other people and experiences by acting them out on stage. By the time I was graduating high school and looking towards studying creative writing and theater in college, I felt like my two loves, love for the arts and love for Jesus, were at odds with one another. I had words rattling around in my head that I had heard at a middle school youth group event. The youth pastor said, if you wouldn't give your favorite movie or CD or TV show to Jesus for his birthday, should you be watching it or listening to it? At the time, I imagined Jesus getting spooked by an off-color joke or curse word and felt sure he was somewhere up there frowning at the works of art that made me feel seen and inspired. I felt scared when I heard passages of scripture preached like our epistle from Philippians this morning. Paul says, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Surely this meant I needed to give up everything, even those things I love the most like art, in order to follow Christ. Ironically, that word rubbish that Paul calls the gains of his former life, skabala, is often translated as dung, and sometimes as a different four-letter expletive. According to my younger self, Paul would have needed to clean up his language before his letters could have been included in the canon. So by the time I graduated from high school, these anxieties of mine, combined with the death of my grandfather, the pastor, had me questioning whether I really wanted to follow Jesus or not. Journal entries from this time found me asking if I wanted to be a Christian, if being a Christian meant giving up my enjoyment and dreams of art. 
In our gospel today, we encounter Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who has decided that Jesus is more than worthy to be anointed with the expensive perfume worth 300 denarii, or a year's wages. At a certain point in the past, I would have seen this story as further evidence that following Jesus required some sort of blind asceticism. But to see Mary's anointing like this would be to misunderstand it as a waste in the same way Judas does. Because this is Mary, Lazarus' sister. She was there when Jesus came, seemingly four days late. She saw Jesus weep at her brother's tomb, and she saw Jesus call him out of the grave. She had witnessed the value of Jesus firsthand. And this gospel story, where Jesus comes to Bethany to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and is served a meal there, recalls a similar story from Luke. In this story from Luke 10, Jesus is invited in for hospitality by Mary and Lazarus' sister Martha. And as Martha runs around cooking and cleaning and setting the table, Mary, again at Jesus' feet, sits listening to him teach. Martha, who is a bit miffed, says to Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This has always been my favorite gospel story. <laughs> uh, growing up in the evangelical church where women are not always respected as theological thinkers or ordained as ministers, Jesus' approval of Mary sanctified my theological curiosity and calling to spiritual leadership. But today I see a further meaning in the story. Not only does Jesus bless Mary's passionate desire to sit at his feet and learn from him, Jesus ordains Mary's passion. Martha is distracted by work she begrudges, while Mary is in pursuit of what her soul loves. Mary sees the obligations placed on her by the world, to use resources efficiently as with the perfume, to be domestic rather than philosophical, as skabala, as dung, compared to the riches of knowing Jesus, the one who brought her brother back to life. And yet, in this willingness to give everything up, Mary receives it all back. Jesus says that what Mary has chosen will not be taken from her. Her place at Jesus' feet will not be taken from her. To put it another way, her greatest passion, her greatest love, will not be taken from her. I had the great pleasure recently of rereading my favorite novel, Jane Eyre, for my Anglican history class at Yale Divinity School. Coincidentally, I was reading and falling in love with this book for the first time around the same time I was struggling with those anxieties I mentioned earlier. Some of my classmates, who are far smarter than me when it comes to the philosophy of religion, brought up the 19th century Christian existentialist Soren Kierkegaard and his treatise on Christian faith called Fear and Trembling. Here, Kierkegaard introduces the figure he calls the Knight of Faith. A Knight of Faith is a person who is paradoxically willing to give up the world while believing that they will receive it back in this life, that which they gave up. Kierkegaard uses the example of a knight who is in love with a princess whom he knows he cannot rescue. Despite the loss, the Knight of Faith nevertheless believes he will be reunited with the princess in this life. I hope I'm not spoiling the novel Jane Eyre here, but you've had a couple hundred years to read it, so I think it's okay. Um, Jane Eyre is in love with Mr. Rochester, who she discovers on their wedding day is still married to his previous wife. And despite her love for Rochester, Jane leaves him because she knows it would be wrong to stay as his mistress. She is willing to give up her greatest love for what she believes is right in the eyes of God. But her love for Mr. Rochester never wanes, and at the end of the book, after his first wife is dead, 
Jane and Rochester miraculously received their happy ending. My Anglican history classmates determined that Jane Eyre is a knight of faith. I would wager that Mary also is a knight of faith. She shuns the conventions and obligations of her time to be close to Jesus, but in this relinquishing, she gains it all. She gets her brother, Lazarus, back in this life. She also is able to pursue her passion, sitting and learning from Jesus in this life. We all possess bottles of costly perfume, resources and accomplishments, relationships and passions, in which our identity and happiness are bound inextricably. During my dark night of the soul, I could not have imagined my life without art, making it and experiencing it. I did not want to consider what I loved so much to be dumb. I remember praying one night with my mom by my side, telling Jesus that I wanted to want to follow him and hoping that would be enough. What I didn't realize at that time, but can see now, was that that moment was the pouring out of the expensive perfume. Because in that moment was willingness. It was willingness to do what I needed to do to be close to Jesus. It was faith. And I, too, have received it all back. There may be times in our lives where we are called to give up a certain relationship or behavior or possession because it stands between us and Jesus, because like Martha and her chores, it distracts us from the work of love and faith. But I have learned that we are given our loves and our passions for a reason. God does not want to take them from us. Like Mary with Lazarus, God wants to reunite us with the highest version of them. From that point forward in my faith journey, I have experienced art whether secular or sacred, and what really is the meaning of that divide, as an aid to my faith, both in, making, both in the making and experiencing of it. Films and novels like Jane Eyre have spoken truths to me in the same way scripture does. I have also learned how to use my own creativity, whether through poetry, music, or sermons, to communicate spiritual truths. And I have no doubt that when I graduate from Divinity School next month, to pursue a career in secular music, that I am doing what God has called me to do and sharing what I have learned with others through art. In being willing to give it all, I have gained everything. Not even that, in being willing to be willing to give it all, I have received everything. And that's really it, isn't it? I don't have to give it all because Jesus already did that for me. Jesus already did that for us. Perhaps this Lenten week, you can find some time to meditate on what it could mean in your life if you were willing to be willing to sit at Jesus' feet, whatever that might mean, knowing that it is only through Jesus that we can have hope, like the night of faith, that we will always receive back what has been lost on this earth. And as incredible as that might seem, it is true. Because it is through Jesus that those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Nothing we ever lose or give up for Jesus' sake will not be regained, plus more, through his resurrection power. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able, as we recall um, where our hearts are set in the words of faith in the Nicene Creed. It, uh, you'll find them on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and of life for the world to come. Amen. For the peace of the world, especially in Ukraine, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the welfare of the Holy Church of God and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our presiding Bishop Michael, for our bishops Ian and Laura, for our rector Harrison, for the clergy, people of Holy Trinity Middletown, St. Andrew's Milford, St. Peter's Milford, Trinity, Milton, and for the Church of Nigeria, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, that they may work together to end terrorism, warfare, and oppression, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, for this town of Guilford, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the vulnerable and defenseless, for the sick and the suffering, for victims of violence, and for those commended to the prayers of the parish, including Janice, Anne, Jean C., Jane, Jerry, Jeffrey Y., Sarah L., Meg, Liz, Bill and family, Maxim, Judy, Lee, Roman, Daniel, Masha, Patrick, Holly and Richard, and all who mourn, and for Sandy, Mandy and Chuck, Patty, Kay, Nancy, Kitty, Wick and Barb, Russ and Joan, Kevin L, Brenny, Jean W, Scott, Molly and Babs, Daniel, Roman, Jerry, uh, Bill and family, once again, I believe it's the same. Jean, Bill, Kelly, Charlie, Jean, Dolores, Rachel, Paul, Karen, Linda, Sky and Jim, Fiona, and others on your heart. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. 
for the poor and, and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, for the sorrowing and the bereaved, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of resurrection, especially Webb Haymaker, Kathy, Jean, Eric, Joseph Peluso, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have that we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have In the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord. To thee, O Lord. Ukraine. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, that they may have wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children, at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Shall we stand for the peace? And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, 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 peace be with you. Well, that's true. He did all of that. Please be seated, except for those of you who have told me you wanted to make an announcement, if you could kind of be making your way up close to the lectern so that um, I could know to call on you. I would just uh, call your attention to the uh, signage at the back of the church um, that uh, at 5 o'clock today there is a vigil, uh, an interfaith vigil. It's going to be offered on the green for Ukraine and for peace in Ukraine, for the end of violence in Ukraine. Um, and it was organized, uh, it is truly interfaith, it was the, the core group that started the organization, we lay folks from Temple Beth Tikva. So uh, uh, I hope to see as many of you there as, as can be, and also on the posted around the, the building. And in yesterday's announcements um, are the things that uh, Dorota Zeller is our Sunday School Director, is collecting uh, to share with uh, St. Michael's, uh, the Archangel, Ukrainian Orthodox, or, or Ukrainian Catholic Church, to share uh, part of their shipments of, of medical goods uh, to Ukraine by way of Warsaw. So they've got a system figured out. So if that's what you would like to do, that's a way to get some stuff there. Another way um, is, of course, to uh, give through the Episcopal Church. Uh, you can go to episcopalrelief.org. Um, there's been a link for that in the, in the, um, uh, the announcements in weeks past. Um, episcopalrelief.org, and that goes, any financial donations that are given there go to the Convocation of Episcopal Churches in Europe and a Anglican Partners uh, in Europe. 
for their work with refugees. Also in your pews, you've, you'll find the, the uh, lavender envelope, or it may be red, anyway, with, for Easter memorials and thanksgivings so that uh, you can help uh, with the celebration of, of the Feast of the Resurrection. So, Ted, you're first in line here. Why don't you go first? I say it uh, feels good to take the mask off. Um, I bring greetings from the Finance Committee, um, and I'm here to uh, give you kind of an early uh, teaser about something we've been working on. Personally, I find that I'm writing less checks each month, that I've converted most of my recurring bills into direct withdrawal from my checking account. And I don't have to worry about, did I pay this? Uh, where's the stamps, et cetera. Um, and uh, several churches here in town have uh, converted their pledge payments over to this as an option. It's only as an option. If you want to pay by check, that's fine. You want to pay by cash, we take that too. But uh, for a lot of people, they find that this is convenient. Um, we've been working on this option, and I am very optimistic that at, by the annual meeting, we will be able to roll out the full details. Uh, we're still testing, and, uh, but uh, so far our work with the Guilford Savings Bank has been quite successful. Um, I'll be in the back after the service. If any of you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, respond. But uh, stay tuned because uh, I think we might have something interesting uh, at the annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And thank you for your good work and uh, with your colleagues on the Finance Committee. Yes, indeed. Okay. Cecilia, let me go first because I can't breathe for the anthem by the time I climb those stairs. <laughs> so um, I'm calling, like you to have a look at the back of your program. Uh, the very last announcement is about the Ecclesia Ballet Company coming to Guilford the Sunday after Easter on April 24th. Um, the blurb that's written here will describe it. The part that we get to play is that this has been a program that's developed for, by the National Episcopal Church with a Creation Care Grant. And Connecticut came up with it, and it's, it's going to be a compilation of what has been done all over the diocese for the church to step up and announce its love of creation, so that uh, climate change is not a political or just a science issue. It's a, a, an issue of the love of creation. So the ballet has to, to do with the four seasons of Vivaldi, as well as, um, I don't quite know how to describe it. There's a local composer who brought a contemporary impact into the ballet. And the dancers are reflecting what creation is suffering through. Uh, and we feel it in our bodies. But we are hosting it. It's going to be on the green. The, all, Harrison has invited all the churches and synagogue in the area. Um, the, creation, the outreach committee came up with the idea of focusing on young people. So the speakers who are going to be part of the panel dialogue are from Pilgrim Fellowship in the community. There's another young speaker um, who has come from Yale Divinity School. And Dorada is going to have a mural for children to paint the Four Seasons. Cecilia is going to have a poetry table. Um, her husband's going to bring our confirmation class out to help with programs and bringing furniture out. Thank you, Will. Uh, it, it's, we've invited everybody we can think of in the community. So 
please look forward to it and pray for sunshine. <laughs> yes, indeed. And this is the poster that you'll see all over town. And we have a whole bunch for you to take and distribute. So I'll see you after church. Thank you. Okay, I'm here to talk about poetry. Uh, we're, <laughs> our next poetry retreat is uh, this upcoming Saturday, the night, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And that's going to be in the rectory. So uh, enjoy a nice, cozy time of poetry. Um, the theme is Lent, um, the, both the liturgical season, but also these um, periods of uh, fasting and preparation in our own lives somewhat more broadly. So um, if you enjoy poetry, if you enjoy creativity, or just, you know, want to try something new, we'll be reading poems, discussing them, and there will be an opportunity to um, write your own if you wish. Again, no need to be a poet or um, be a person of letters to join. Uh, hope to see you there. There will be refreshments. Um, it was really great last time, so we're looking forward to uh, this upcoming Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. So, right, that's one to three on Saturday in the, in the rectory. Um, from two to five in the uh, parish hall and the parish hall kitchen, there's going to be getting ready for... Um, for Palm Sunday. There's going to be soup making for all ages and brownie baking and palm cross making. And uh, so there's all of that that's going to be happening uh, from uh, two to five. Uh, again, it's an all ages event. So, uh, and it will go more quickly the more folks are, are there. But we especially hope families with kids will, will come and have a um, a, a time to be together as as families. The, our ECW is also um, next Sunday. Uh, uh, that soup, by the way, uh, is is that they're making next Saturday. It will be served following this service next Sunday. Now, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and we're going to go back to the tradition that we had pre-COVID of meeting with uh, St. George and First Church on the green at 945 for the Liturgy of the Palms. So come at 945 and join us on the green for the Liturgy of the Palms. And then stay after the 10 o'clock service that follows for um, soup in the parish hall and outside if you like. So all of that is coming up and the ECW is going to have a, a, a bake sale and they're getting together on Thursday to get ready for that. Um, so did I do right by that, Lisa? Okay. Um, Dorota, did you have anything more that you would like to say about that? Oh, okay. Um, and uh, uh, seeing Dorota there reminds me she has a box uh, just outside the, uh, behind where she's sitting. Um, uh, for your donations, about which I already spoke, Dorota, for uh, the Ukrainian relief. So, um, but you could also, if that gets over full, you put them on the children's altar, that would be grand. And I um, just want to thank those of you who have uh, weathered the long uh, bout of our COVID protocols and, and uh, uh, wearing masks for longer than maybe you thought was necessary. And, and some of us still are wearing masks for our own protection and maybe for the protection of others. And I will be wearing a mask uh, because that's what our bishops do. Um, so I'm following their pattern uh, during the celebration and distribution of communion. We're still uh, serving communion in one kind at, uh, at the children's altar. Um, and, uh, but there'll be a change in that as of a couple weeks down the road. But for today and next Sunday, we'll continue to uh, have communion in one kind served from the, the children's altar. So are there any birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate today? 
Really? Oh, good. Come on down. Jack. Oh. oh, there it is. What happened to you? I used to know someone who looked like you, but it was a lot shorter. <laughs> uh, watch over your servant Jack, O Lord, as his days increase. Bless and guide him wherever he may be. Strengthen him when he stands. Comfort him when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise him up if he falls. And in his heart, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of his life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Thank you. We've been richly blessed. In the life of the kingdom, let us with gladness present the alms and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord. things come of thee, O Lord, and of thy own have we given thee. Amen. We continue the great thanksgiving 
We're using Eucharistic prayer form one, which begins in the prayer book on page 402. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You reveal yourself to us and to all people through your Son, Jesus Christ, and you bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy, and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. And so we join the saints and angels in proclaiming your glory as we sing. Praise you, O God, for the salvation of the whole world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so, Father, we bring you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate the memorial of your Son by means of this holy bread and cup. We show forth the sacrifice of his death and proclaim his resurrection until he comes again. Gather us by this holy communion into one body in your Son, Jesus Christ. Make us a living sacrifice of praise by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Take us away the sin. 
The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Our post-communion prayer is on page 366 in the Book of Common Prayer, page 366. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you with gladness of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Bowing our heads before the Lord, let us pray. Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this, your people, that rightly observing this holy season of Lent, we may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will. And this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.